God has allowed me to work on these Baptist um, grounds where they have this, uh, where we change oil for cars. And I'm just a Pentecostal boy that loves Jesus. And I just want to let you know that um, I get the opportunity to change oil, but I anoint them with oil as they go through uh, the line. Uh, and those that are sick in body, uh, that uh, they come to me to say, Brother Torres, can you pray for me? I, and they right. let me know what's going on. And I just thank God that I'm there. And uh, I got invited to a um, Celebrate Recovery. And it's a, 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 uh, in a uh, meeting, and God, um, I was just sitting there with my friend and stuff, and they said, Manny, would you like to say the serenity prayer? And I said, sure. So I went up there, and I didn't know, and I just started praying uh, like we pray here. I just started, I didn't even see the sign there. I just started thanking God for all the healings that he's about to do and what he's going to do. And, and the Holy Ghost came upon me, and I began to speak in tongues Hallelujah. and take authority. And I just thank God for that. Hallelujah. That I can just sit there in that setting and not be ashamed, even from prison to praise, I'm still there. You know, just let God know that, you know what? He's still working and stuff like that. And folks came up and said, I felt something different right here. I felt an anointing. I felt that something that was different that you said. And I turned around and the pastor said, you're supposed to read that. I said, oh, okay, so... I said there was a serenity prayer, but I just want to let you know that, you know, that you never know when you're going to be used. I don't want the microphone. Um, I just felt impressed. Um, you know, uh, I just want to say God can do anything Amen. in your life. Yes. And I want to say that because... Um, Human nature, we look at the outside of people. And I just feel like we need to testify sometimes where God has brought us from so people can believe that God can do it for them. And way back when, you know, it's buried in the blood of Jesus, but I used to be a single, uh, pregnant, meth addict, depression, suicidal, all kinds of stuff. And God has brought me from that. Uh, and it, pastor's wife. I mean, unbelievable. Un, every day, I'm like, thank you, Jesus. I don't know where I'd be without you because I was lost. And he found me. And I just, if you give him the chance, you every day, and especially when you're feeling, you know, alone, just reach out to him because he will change your life. It takes time. It takes time. But you just have to keep pressing on. We, we understand. We've been there. There's, if, if God has ever deliv delivered anybody here from uh, drug addiction or alcoholism, um, can you just raise your hand? Hallelujah. Absolutely. God can do anything. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Raise your hand again. Look, look around. Think about that. Think about that. You're not the only one that goes through issues. The Bible says in Psalms 139, verse 14, I will praise thee. Here's why. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works. And that my soul knoweth right well. All too many times we think that we're not worth it. That's because the world tries to inject its, its thoughts into us. The Bible tells me I'm good looking. I'm wonderfully made. Yeah, I'm fat. I'm bald. Trying to lose weight. But my wife, she says I'm good looking. So I'm going to claim that in Jesus' name. But you know what's greater than that? My daddy says I'm good looking too. My daddy says I'm worth it. 
My daddy says I'm righteous. My daddy says I'm beautifully and wonderfully made. And it's worth the effort that he put into my life. It's worth the investment that he put into my life that he instilled in me. And he instilled in you. And that's why you're here today. It isn't because you decided to come. It's because the Spirit of God drew you here, praise God. And the faster that we recognize that, the faster we comprehend that, the faster we understand that it was the drawing of God's Spirit because He loves you and He sees something inside of you that you don't see within yourself. I was a drug addict. I was unrecognizable. The Bible says I was in a state of leprosy or sin. I was disfigured. But God has changed my complexion. He's changed my wardrobe. He's given me beauty for ashes. He loves me. And he loves you too. And that's why he invests in you. So don't ever step into the presence of God with your head down. Lift your head up. Lift your voice up. Raise your hands and say, thank you, Jesus, for loving me. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me when I did not love myself. I didn't love you, but you saw fit because, because you had a purpose for me that I couldn't recognize on my own. And you understood that this purpose was going to take a lifetime to develop, praise God. And God will never, ever, 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 ever give up on you as long as you stay on that potter's wheel, bro. And as long as you allow God to, to, to work in your life and as long as God keeps his hands on you and molds you, praise God, he will never give up on you. So don't ever give up on God. Don't ever give up on God. He's always there. He's always there. Why don't you give the Lord a hand clap of praise? I'm always inspired by how God transforms a life. How God works on an individual. Uh, I've known Brother Angelo for, well, ever since he was a toddler, I think. Praise God. And he's grown to be a fine young man. He has a passion for the mission field. Amen. And whatever God's will is for his life, I'm for that. Praise God. You know, we don't always agree with what somebody is doing. Amen. But if someone has a vision from God, a call on their life, who am I to get in the way of that? That's what they tried to do to Joseph. They tried to put out the fire, the vision, praise God, that God had given Joseph. And from the time that Joseph received the promise till the time that he was up in Pharaoh's house, there was a lot of issues in between, praise God. He went into the pit. He went to Potiphar's house. He went to prison. He, he suffered all these things, but yet God's purpose never altered. It never altered. Through great loss, through great darkness, through great, through great difficulty, God always showed himself alive. And the beautiful thing about Joseph is from the promise to the pit, to Potiphar, to prison, to his promise, he's had a balanced life. He had a balanced life. And so what am I saying? Through the valleys and through the mountains, you're going to struggle. You're going to have high times. But if you just stay balanced, praise God, and trust in the promise, in the vision, in the calling, in his purpose, he will see you through. He will see you through. I'm going to give Brother Angel about two or three minutes. Amen. Uh, he wants to share his burden. Praise the Lord. 
I promise you I'm not going to sneak a preach. Um, <laughs> some of these people are not even here, but I am so thankful for our leaders, um, Brother and Sister Richardson, for being an amazing missionary, missionary host, our translators, the Bible school students, um, my amazing team for making this such an unfor unforgettable trip. Um, as well, I... As, I, as well as I want to thank you all for your sacrificial giving, your time in prayer, and believing in me. I have a two-minute video um, to show my appreciation what God's doing in Madagascar. Diaku, um, Ian, now I love you guys. There are so many unreached people around the world. The world's population is nearing the 8 billion people mark. Will someone go reach them? In Madagascar alone, there are almost 29 million people, with 11 million of them being children aged 15 and under. As we drove by villages, we wondered, will they ever hear the gospel? We need laborers to go into the harvest. We need people to go. The 2022 Next Steps team that trained in Madagascar received a special word from the Lord. This is the journey God has set before you. There is nothing that can stop its plan. This is not about you or what you can do. This is not about what you can accomplish with your own power. This is about being a tool in God's hands. This is about being a willing vessel in spite of your limitations, in spite of your weaknesses, and in spite of your past. God will use you for the miraculous. All of the honor and glory will go to Him if you just make yourself available to be used. Walk in peace in Him, for His presence will go before you. understanding of his ways, his power, and his presence, you will begin to witness what he can do to and through you. You will go home changed, and hopefully you will never go back to being the old you. Amen. If we could all stand this morning. Amen. Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm ready for the word of the Lord. Amen. You know, the beautiful thing about praise and worship, amen, is I've said this many a times. We come in from a world that floods our minds with all kinds of stuff. And the reason why God instituted praise and worship is so when we come into the presence of God, we lift our hands, we get all that junk out, and we empty ourselves of all that worldly influence, that worldly junk. Why does he do that? So God can start over, and God could begin to pour into us, amen, and we, we are able to receive it, amen. I want to walk out of here flooded with the word of God. I want to walk out of here changed by the power of God. I'm so appreciative for the via loans. Amen. Uh, we get a double whammy tonight. We get a youth service from uh, young, the younger brother via loan, junior. Amen. Uh, but uh, right now, uh, we're going to have brother senior via loan come and preach to us, brother. Everyone say, God bless brother via loan. Praise the Lord. I feel blessed to be here this morning. I, it's a privilege. I thank our pastor, Pastor Torres, for this invitation. We come here before you humbly, my family and I, and just feeling blessed that we can be here in Camas. When I walked into this place on Friday, I testify that it reminds me of the church, the Pentecostal church I grew up when I was a child, filled with the Holy Ghost, that temple. It just, it was the right Pentecostal environment. 
my kids on Friday night, wow, that was just an awesome environment. So I feel the Holy Ghost today. I just want to be guided by the Holy Ghost. We, we salute you, my wife, my beautiful wife, my children, my daughter-in-law. We're here today, and we're here to serve, and we're here just to be, be blessed and rejoice, in you, or rejoice with you. I pastor Christ the Rock Church in Burlington. Pray for them today. They're going to be going into service in about an hour and a half. That God just bless them. Amen. I don't want to take up too much more time, but I'm going to ask that you open up your Bibles with me in the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 20. The book of 2 Chronicles chapter 20. When a minister prepares to preach the word, we seek God and we seek God and we seek God. And, you know, sometimes we let ourselves get in the way of what God is doing. And this week, I just, I, I thought I knew exactly what God wanted, the message God wanted for Kamas and this weekend. And I thought there's a series that God wants me to, a, a series of, of two preachings God wants me to preach and you know, God just stirred me up, and he redirected me on Friday. He redirected me for Sunday, and I trust that the message is right. I trust God because he is perfect. So I ask that you pray for me, that God may, that I may deliver this message and exactly as God has asked me to do this. Amen. The book of 2 Chronicles, chapter 20. Let's go to verses 1 through 3. We're going to jump down to verse 17. The word of God says, for his honor and for his glory. It came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon and with them other side, the Ammonites, came against Jehosh, Jehoshaphat to battle. Then there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea in this side, Syria. And behold, they be in Habazah Tamar, which is Egedi. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all of Judah. Verse 17 says, Ye shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. I want to ask our pastor to pray for this message. You may be seated saying glory to, glory to God. Jehoshaphat was the fourth king of the kingdom of Judah, and he raised for 25 years. He was known for being the king that brought peace and prosperity to Judah. He was known to be one of Israel's greatest kings, but right now he was in a predicament. The word of God says that Jehoshaphat was in a really difficult situation. He was about to face the battle, I want to say the battle of a lifetime. He was about to go into an impossible situation. He was going to go into a situation which was too much to bear. And he wasn't, he felt like he wasn't going to be able to fight this battle. It was one of those situations where, you know, God, this doesn't look good. God, I don't know what I'm going to do. God, I have no idea how this is going to turn out, God. And the battle was too big for him. But the Bible says in verse 1, it says, The children of Moab, the children of Ammon, and with them some of the Maonites, they came against Jehoshaphat in battle. So three nations came against Judah. Three very powerful nations came against Judah. 
you know, it was a really bad situation, and I want to be able to, I want to be able to have us understand, and I want to be able to illustrate this to you, and I just, God just said, you know, when I, when, when I talk to uh, the brothers and sisters in Burlington, we talk about soccer. That's our football. But I thought in commas, let's talk about football. So here's what it looks, here's what it looks like to all of you football fans, the situation that Joseph, Jehoshaphat was in. So if you can imagine the L.A. Rams against the Buffalo Bills, against Kansas City, and against the Green Bay Packers, that's what Jehoshaphat was up against. He was up against an impossible situation. The people reported to Jehoshaphat, they're coming against us, Jehoshaphat. It doesn't look good. Jehoshaphat realized if God doesn't intervene, I am not going to win, and I do not stand a chance. I want to title this message today, When the Battle is Too Difficult. When the Battle is Too Difficult. I want to talk about what should happen, what should happen when the battle is too difficult. So too many Christians today are falling by the wayside. Too many souls are falling by the wayside. We as Christians, many of us are not surviving the battle because the devil is active. My God says that one day he's going to meet me in the clouds with the shout of the archangel, with the sound of a trumpet, the rapture, is the, 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 I, you, I'm sure you've thought about this, and I'm sure maybe your pastors reminded you, but the prophecies have been fulfilled. The rapture is around the corner, and the devil knows it. He knows the rapture is near. He knows Jesus is coming. He and his army are busy planning their demonic strategies, keeping the world distracted. His job is to make sure that none of us make it to heaven. His job is to make sure that none of the souls make it to heaven. His job is to keep the souls distracted. And right now he has the world distracted with pleasures, with drugs, with fornication, with alcohol, with uh, uh, materialism, even in the church. Even in the church, the devil's deceiving the Christians with false doctrines, doctrines of devils and falsehoods. His word says, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. You know, there's a false doctrine of tongues going on. There are people that will tell you, I mean, I, I've had people come into our church pastor, visitors, and they get uncomfortable when they see people speaking in tongues. Because there's doctrines that tell you the tongues come from the devil. I was listening to the testimony, a testimony of a, 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 Pente a woman who grew up in the Pen a, a Pentecostal church. She had come out of witchcraft. God had delivered her. And she was giving testimony about when she was growing up as a little girl that people would pray over her and they would make them lay down on the ground and they said that they were angels. She fell into sin, she fell into drugs, and then she fell into witchcraft. She testifies about black magic and white magic, black witchcraft and white witchcraft. She practiced both. She testifies that in their rituals, these witches would begin to speak in tongues, and they even had healings. So then she would testify, she testified, but when God delivered me, God, I was baptized, I, God, I was forgiven, and God delivered me. And then when I would hear the brothers and the sisters speak in tongues, I thought, I can't speak in tongues. That's of the devil. That's what we did in our rituals. Until the, God, until the day God filled her with the Holy Ghost. And she realized, wait a minute, this is different. This feels different. You know what? Tongues belong to Christians first. But the devil wants to deceive the church as well. Jehoshaphat was in a bad situation. He had options. He could have just did it himself. He could have figured it out himself. 
He could have just what we men tend to do ourselves. It just take care of it ourselves. He could have just planned out the battle in his head. You know, I was sharing with the church the other day, and I share this now and then. I have a neighbor across the street, and his name is Peter, and I've planned out many battles against Peter. He's that thorn in my side. I don't know how long God's going to keep him there. When we moved into our neighborhood about six years ago and we started the work in our home, Peter would always look for reasons to come and just complain. We started off with just a few cars coming. Once it got to too many cars, Peter would come over and he would just publicly humiliate me in front of the entire congregation of all the brothers and the sisters. And I would just, okay, keep your mouth shut, James. Keep your mouth shut, James. He said he would, he would continually come and he would insult. And, you know, thank God we moved out. Of, we, 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 God gave us a different place to congregate. And where, where God had put us in, 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 the, in the location that we're at right now. But, you know, every now and then, I still think about Peter when I walk, my, when I walk our dog. And I have this fantasy. You know, we have, uh, you know, those, those um, leashes that dogs have that coil up and they come in a big plastic case. So, Brother Manny, I would every now and I still, you know, every now and then it still, it still happens. And he rides his green bike around the neighborhood like he owns the neighborhood. Um, not a very nice person at all. And so I would imagine, okay, and, and he's come up to, he always comes up to say things to me when people are around. And I say, okay, one day he's going to get me by myself. <laughs> and so, Pastor, I imagine this, him coming and, and, and approaching me, and I just have this fantasy of that dog leash going right through his teeth. <laughs> that is awful, isn't it? But it feels good to fantasize about it. <laughs> but then God stops me. He says, no, you got to speak to him about Jesus. you got to testify to him. But if it were up to me, it would be a different story. So Jehoshaphat could have planned it out. Jehoshaphat could have taken care of it himself. So in this story, we learn from Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, the, in the, the, the Bible says... Jehoshaphat won, the Israel won the battle. Jehoshaphat used very important weapons to win this battle. Weapons that many of us are not using today to fight our battles. He used weapons that we are not using today. I want to talk about the first weapon that Jehoshaphat used to fight this battle. His first weapon, as we study this story in Second Chronicles, is that Jehoshaphat sought God in prayer. His first, in verse 3, it says, Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all of Judah. The Word of God says that the first thing Jehoshaphat did is he called the people to prayer and fasting. He thought, we have no other option. We have, he had no other option but to, to turn but he had no other place to turn besides to God. When we get to this point, when we get to the point where we have no other option, I have found this is when God does his best, best work. Many of us, God, seek as a last resort. The first, the first thing that Jehoshaphat did is he sought God in prayer. If you'll notice in verse 5 through 6, And Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court, and said, O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven? And rulest thou not over all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in thy hand is there not power and might, so that none is able to withstand thee? Notice the confidence that Jehoshaphat had in the Lord. He said, God, are you not the great God? Is our God, are you the God who's done all, who's done the impossible? God, you are amazing. You are amazing, God. You are the ultimate God. Nothing is impossible for you. You are the creator of all things, God. Does this sound like your prayer? 
Does this sound like your prayer? Many of us are, God, oh, poor me. Why am I in this situation? I've been there. Jehoshaphat went to prayer, and he went into prayer and praise mode. He started acknowledging who God is, what position God has in his life. He was recognizing, God, you are so great. Nothing is impossible for you, God. Nobody can defeat you, God. I came, because, I came to you because you are the Almighty. You're the all-powerful. You're the Holy God. I have no idea how this is going to turn out, God, but you know how this is going to turn out, God. And he said, but no matter what, God, I will still praise you. No matter what the outcome, God, I will still serve you. I will still come to declare that you are the almighty God, and, I'm, I, and I will always be your biggest fan. You know, I think about a testimony of a young woman in our church when I read this story. Jehoshaphat begins to declare how powerful you are, God. And he begins to tell God, no matter what, God, I'm going to serve you. We had a young woman in our church a, 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 over, well, almost two years ago. Uh, her babies are now a year, a little over a year. She was pregnant with twins. And she had a difficult pregnancy. And I don't remember what the disorder or what the illness is or whatever the disease it was that the doctor said that was, that was in her womb. But she had to be in the hospital for quite a bit of time because these babies wanted to come out. And I remember in this situation, there was a lot of concern of the doctors and when they, they told her, one of your babies may come early. And it got to the point where they told her that if you don't have a specific surgery, she went to the doctor for a checkup, and maybe it was a couple months early, if you don't have this specific surgery, you may lose your babies. Your babies want to come out. And with this surgery, there are risks. If you have this surgery, you could lose one baby or both babies. But if you don't have this surgery, your babies will come early, and it's too early. And basically, they told her, the chances of your baby surviving isn't really good. And Pastor, I remember when they called me, the husband called me, and they had to make a decision because they went to the hospital with the expectation that they were just going in for a checkup, and the doctor said, we need to make a decision now about what you're going to do. You can have this surgery, or you can just go home and take the risk of losing your babies. But if you have the surgery, you may lose one of the babies, or you may lose both of them. And I remember when they called me out of desperation in their hospital room, and they were asking, Pastor, what do we do? What do we do, Pastor? And I said, I can't decide for you. And the father was desperate, and he was in tears. And I said, let me talk to your wife. And I said, Sister, ultimately, this decision is yours. Sister, I believe in a powerful God. I believe in a God of miracles. But I said, sister, here's what God wants to hear from you. If you want me to pray with you, if you want me to pray for you, all God wants to know is what are you going to do? What are you going to do regardless of the outcome? God just wants to know. God, no matter what. I will serve you. I will praise you. I will glorify you. I said, sister, that's all God wants to know. You decide whether he takes one baby, whether he takes two babies. He wants to know, are you still going to serve me? Are you still going to glorify me? And the sister began, I could feel the presence just come upon her. Pastor, I'm going to have the surgery. 
And I glorify God because today was, she, they, 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 are, they come to church tired and they come to church uh, 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 beat up because now they have two babies and that, that this is their, now they have three children and those babies are the most healthy, beautiful babies you will ever see. Twin babies. God just wants to know, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Are you going to serve me no matter what? The notice what he does. Art thou art not thou God who didst drive out the inhabitants of these land of this land before the people of Israel and gave it to the seed of Abraham thy friend forever? So he starts to remind God of the things of the past that God had done. You know, God, church, God doesn't need a reminder. God doesn't need you to remind them about what He's done, but He, he but because He already knows, He doesn't forget anything. But God wanted Jehoshaphat to go through a human process. He needed Jehoshaphat to go through a human process. Jehoshaphat began to remind God of the great things that he had done. He's doing something very important here. What Jehoshaphat is doing is more for him rather than it is for God. He's looking at the past to encourage his future. God, you've done all of these things for me in the past. You've done all of these things for your people. You did all of these great things, God. I remember them clearly. So Jehoshaphat was human. He was experiencing fear, and he was experiencing doubt. I believe that he was experiencing some anxiety in this situation. He was fighting against Things that at that moment, things that you and I fight against every single day. He was fighting against doubt. He was fighting against anxiety. He was fighting against insecurity. He was fighting against fear. But he knew that he had to get himself into a position. He had to get himself to a place. He needed to be in a place that God needed him to be into. He was leading God's people. He had a responsibility. These people were behind him. He needed to get himself to the place where God was going to do his best work. So in other words, Jehoshaphat had to look back in order to look forward. He had to look back in order to look forward. So the best way to look forward in the battle is to look back and remember and remind God of the things he has done in the past. I am impressed in this church. There are a lot of you who know the power of God. There are a lot of you who've experienced the impossible, the, what, what human, the human eye sees as impossible for God. There are a lot of miracles in this church. He was reminding God. He was taking himself to a place. God, I remember what you did. I heard what you did, God. He had to encourage himself to move forward. You know, I have a lot of testimonies about the power of God. When I fall into a place or I'm in a battle or I'm in a situation where I begin to start doubting, I begin to reflect of the past miracles that God has done in my life, the past miracles that God has done in my wife's life. I'm going to share a few of those with you. You know, when we were, when, when my wife and I first got married, we were told that we could not have children. My wife had a tumor on her pituitary gland. It was a benign tumor, but it, called, it, it, it caused an illness called prolactinoma. And then there's another half of the word. I can't remember why it's a long disease or illness. And this caused my wife's body to prevent her from ovulating. So when we first got married and after a, a few months, we thought, my wife was pregnant. We went to the doctor, and the doctor said, you're not pregnant, but it's interesting because your body says you're pregnant. So my wife had all of the signs, and then after some studies, they told her, you have a benign tumor in the back of your pituitary, on, on your pituitary gland, basically on your brain. So you can't have children as long as this tumor is there. So... 
I remember that's the worst thing you could tell to a young family, to a young couple. So we took it to God in prayer. My wife had to go through a process. It's, it was either brain surgery or it was a medication. And I remember the medication that they gave my wife to be able to dissolve that tumor would cause my wife to be sick. It would cause her to vomit. It would cause her to faint. And they said, you've got to take this medicine because that tumor has to dissolve. And once that tumor is gone, then it's going to stop interrupting your body and you're going to be able to have babies. We were devastated. We were crushed. We thought, okay, maybe we're just going to have to adopt a baby. So for the first three years of our lives, many of us just want that first few years without having children so we can enjoy life. Well, we did. God did that for us. But to be told that we could not have children was devastating. And I remember my wife would build, uh, uh, she actually, by faith, I would come home and my wife would, she started buying baby things. She started buying things that you would buy that when you have a baby, blankets. And, and she said, by faith, God is going to give us a baby. By faith, God is going to give us a baby. And I remember being a little boy, and God would speak to me, and God would speak to me in dreams. And yeah, I grew up in a Pentecostal church like this when I was a little boy. And I remember writing the name of Jesus on a rock. And even as a little boy, God would give me visions. And I grew up in a community where it was nothing but non-Hispanic and Caucasian folk. That's the best way to say it, I guess. I grew up in Bellingham, Washington. There were no other Mexicans around. There was maybe one or two in the entire town. This was in the 60s and 70s. But I remember God would give me this vision. I would see myself around a table having dinner, and I had a Mexican wife, and there was a little boy in a suit. But, you know, there, there's, as children, we don't remember our dreams. But I remembered that dream clearly. I said, God, but wait a minute. What about that dream? And then I thought, no way on earth am I going to find a Mexican woman in this town. <laughs> God had to bring her in from Mexico. Yeah, and so it wasn't until I was 31 years old when I got married and I was waiting. God, you showed me in that vision. Oh, there were other opportunities, but they couldn't stay. They were Mexican women. But I thought, okay, God. So then I remember that vision, and I just, okay, Lord, you, you, you're you perfect. I remember seeing a baby in there. And then my first preaching came on as I gave into the calling to the ministry, and it was probably, I think this was in 1998, and I preached my first sermon in the congregation, and God said, prophesy. And I prophesied a year from now, we're going to have a baby. And then I thought, Pastor, what did I do? If I don't have a baby, they're going to take me out back and they're going to stone me. Because that's what they did in the Bible times. But I thought, okay, God, I said it. I believe you, God. I remember that little dream, God, and I remember that vision. I've never forgotten it. And my wife never stopped praying. My wife never stopped buying those gifts. And we were told... Uh, Ma'am, uh, you have to be careful because if you get pregnant, you have to stop taking this medicine because you're going to kill you. This medicine will kill your baby. And the medicine was so strong. And I remember one time, Brother Pastor, I was getting ready for work and I was walking across the Baroque and I, the, and I saw the medicine on the corner of the dresser. And God said, tell your wife to stop taking it. And then my wife, I don't know if it was the same day, but God told her the same thing. Stop taking the medicine. It was hard for me to watch my wife vomit and be sick and pass out I would have to on the way to church I'd have to stop the car because she needed to vomit out the side of the car so then she stopped she said okay 
I'm going to stop taking the medicine. And then I remember we went to the doctor and the doctor said, because she had to go for a checkup for this problem, and said, uh, what did you do? Why did you stop taking the medicine? The, the tumor is going in reverse. It's getting bigger and not smaller. Bigger and not smaller. And he said, you've done, I remember we were in that, we were in that, 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 me, that, that one of several appointments and we just looked at each other and we were just devastated. And he said, you just undid everything that we've done. Now we've got to start all over. I remember we went home, Pastor, and we, this was a Saturday, and well, the first thing my wife did is threw herself on the couch, and she was just crying and crying and crying. And I was crying and crying and crying. And then the phone rang. And they, it was a, the nurse from the doctor's office. She said, you know, Mr. V alone, we forgot to do something. We forgot to check the pregnancy test before your wife left. The tumor had come back. It was bigger. He said, Mr. Villone, your wife is pregnant. Your wife is going to have a baby. We don't know how this is going to happen, but your wife is pregnant. I began to glorify God. My wife began to glorify God. So then on the day of the delivery, and that's that one right here, the biggest one. On the day of the delivery, and then this he was stubborn. He wouldn't turn around. He was sitting up. And I remember watching the doctors trying to adjust this child so that he would come out normal. But they had to give my wife a C-section. I'm not the type of person that gets skittish around blood. And that day that we were in the surgery room, a sister was there with my wife, one of her very close friends. And my wife had a curtain here so she couldn't see what was going on. She was fully conscious. And I was over there just watching them cut and cut and cut layers and layers and layers. And I remember I was telling my wife what was happening. And, and, and the doctors just thought, this is this, and this is when you could, with the days when you could go into the axor surgery room. It was a big surgery room. And I kept going back and forth. And we were just waiting and waiting. And I said, honey, I think it's almost time. It's almost time. And she said, honey, just sing. Just sing. I'm like, I don't sing. I'm not a singer. She said, just sing a song. I thought, okay. So the man with the anesthesia, uh, I said, I'm going to sing a song. I don't remember how, but he ended up turning the music down. So I just positioned myself, and they were over here. And I began to sing the song. Oh, what a miracle. Oh, gran milagro. Oh, what a miracle. Christ is in me. Oh, what a miracle. Christ is in me. Oh, gran milagro es Cristo en mí. As I began to sing and I looked over and I saw Isaac's hand come out of my wife's stomach. And I said, honey, I see it. It's time. And at that moment, the power and the glory of God fell upon that place. I began to speak in tongues. My wife began to speak in tongues. The sister began to speak in tongues because this was a miracle because the doctor said, this shouldn't have happened. This shouldn't have happened. The tumor was there. This should not have happened. We've never used birth control. That tumor went away. Then it came back. And then it went away. Then it came back three times. And now we have three babies. My wife is completely healed of the tumor after this one was born. God is perfect. So when I go through a trial and when I go through a tribulation, I said, God, nothing is impossible for you because I remember exactly what you did. You're going to do it again, God. And I remember one time we had no money. We were just newlyweds. And my wife was going to go get a job, and I don't know if she had the job yet at the laundry. And I was working, and I had to leave my job. God was take, took me out of an industry. He didn't want me in. I went through a period of time without work. And we needed some money. We had no money for our bills. 
And I remember my wife, I had worked in downtown Seattle. We lived in Everett. And my wife, or I, did I work in Linwood or Everett? Maybe I worked in Linwood. But my wife was waiting for the bus. She was at a bus stop in Everett. And my, you know, my wife is a woman of faith. And she knew God was going to provide. Here I was freaking out. What am I going to do? I've got to get a second job. I've got to get a third job. What am I going to do? My wife was standing at the bus stop waiting for the bus. And this car pulls right up in front of her. What color was it? Como? Black car. And the window rolls down and a woman, a woman hands her a envelope. And she said, this is for you. This is for you. Take it. This is for you. And my wife, you know, this is Everett. But she took the envelope. And she opened it up. And there was over $300 cash in there. Just the right amount of money that we needed at that moment. One other small testimony. One time when we were out of a vehicle and we only had two car, we only had one vehicle. My wife decided, you know what? God's going to give me a vehicle. God, I know you're, nothing is impossible for you, God. You're going to give me a car. Isaac was about nine years old, maybe seven years old. I don't remember. And, you know, my wife speaks English. The girl can, she can go in English. She's a survivalist. But her writing of what that point, what that, at that time wasn't too great. I was at work and she sat, Isaac got home from school. She goes, honey, you're going to write me a letter. Get a pen, get a, get a pen and get a paper. I want you to write this letter. She grabbed the Christian directory. She picked a dealer and she said, this, is man, this man is going to give us a vehicle. You write this letter. And she, he had, she had him write the letter. God told me that you have a car in your lot that you're going to give me. My husband's a minister. We've gone through this, this, and this. Right now, we only have one vehicle because my vehicle broke down. And Isaac in this process is thinking, Mom, you're crazy. <laughs> but he just, he obeyed. And he just wrote and wrote and wrote. So I didn't know, I had no idea about this. Neither one of them told me. Three months later, my wife calls me while I was at work. And she said, honey, guess what? I'm like, what? She goes, we're going to get a new, it was a used car, but we're going to get a car. There's a dealership. And she said, I wrote, I didn't tell you, but I wrote a letter about three months ago. Or Isaac wrote it for me. And we sent it. And the man called me and said, ma'am, I got your letter. I have a vehicle for you. So then I called the man. I wanted to make sure this was on the up and up. So he was a broker in Lake, I worked in downtown Seattle. He was a broker in Lake City, and he, would be, he was the type of guy who would look for your vehicles. And so he had a, he, one of his clients was a doctor, and so at the time she wanted a Nissan Pathfinder, I think eight years prior. It was time for her to upgrade, so she called him and said, here, I, I want you to find me a different vehicle. So he had a small lot in Lake City, so he found her a new vehicle, but he realized this one's too old. It's eight years old. I'm not going to be able to get, sell this thing. So he said, I've got a vehicle for you. So can you come get it? So the next day I took the bus to work so I could take the bus to Lake City. And he wanted to meet me. He wanted to make sure I wasn't some crazy person either. So when I walked in, he goes, I really wanted to meet you. I was so impressed by your wife's letter. because I'm a Christian, he says. So here's your vehicle. And I drove away with that vehicle. That vehicle was a blessing. How has God blessed you? How has God blessed you? you got to tell God, God, I remember when you did this, God. Nothing is impossible for you, God. I remember when you did this for me, God. So I'm going to march forward, and I'm going to trust you, God, and I'm going to leave it in your hands, God, that you're going to take care of it. How has God blessed you? In verse 9, our, it says, Our ancestors have built your temple in the land, God. And he says, And we said, If calamity comes upon us, we will stand in the temple we will cry out to you, and you will hear us, and you will save us, God. You promised, God. You promised, God, that you would hear us. You promised, God, that you would save us. So he was getting worked up for God. 
I think you and I need to get worked up for God a little bit more during the battle, during the trial, during the situation. We need to get serious. We need to forget our pride. We need to forget about what others think. We need to get to the altar. We need to keep, wor- keep stop worrying about whether our hair is going to get messed up or whether our suit's going to get wrinkled. We need to get on our face, and we just need to glorify God and remind God of all of the wonderful things that he has done. He promised you. Hebrews 13.5 says, I will never leave you or I will forsake you. We just look to you, God. Jehoshaphat was saying, our eyes are on you, God. So where are your eyes, church? Where are your eyes? Are they on your job? Are they on your money? Are they on your friends? You know what's funny over in in a Hispanic church? Because we have, our church is mainly Mexican. We have a, we've got a Salvadorian. We've got, we call them Mexicans mixtas. Those of us are, are those of us who allowed our tribes in Mexico and they're in the Spanish uh, conquest to be Spaniardized. <laughs> then there were tribes where they didn't allow them to be Spaniardized. So we have people, we Hawkins, we've got Islanders. So we have a little bit of a mix, but it's mainly Hispanic. But you know what's interesting in it's church, Hispanic churches, brother, in the summer, a lot of the seats are empty because we're landscapers, painters. But when we got money in our pocket, things are good. We don't need God. Come winter, the seats are full. Because there's no more money in your pocket. So I tell the church, you know what? You better be in church all the time thanking God that the grass grows. Thanking God that the rain falls so that grass grows so that you have a job. Thanking God that the rain falls to beat the paint off that wall so that you have a job. What are we looking to? Where are our eyes? Jehoshaphat said, God, we have no plan. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you, God. Number two, he was patient and persistent waiting was his second weapon. God's instruction is unusual. If you'll notice, it's odd, but it's profound. Verse 15, and he said, hearken ye, all Judah and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou King Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord unto you, be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. He said, I just need you, Jehoshaphat. To be quiet and to be still. Don't argue with me. Don't try to reason your way out of it. Don't question me. Just wait. Just shut up and wait. That's what he was saying. Just be quiet. Just wait. God is telling you. God is telling me. That your victory does not depend on you. My victory does not depend on me. It depends on the Lord. And we must patiently wait. Because if you don't patiently wait, what we start doing is we start kicking down doors that shouldn't be open. We start kicking down doors that were never meant to be open. And then we just mess things up. He said, just be quiet, Jehoshaphat. Just patiently wait. I love the story in Exodus 19 where God was about to perform the greatest miracle of all time. He was about to part the Red Sea. So the sea was in front of them. The Egyptians were behind them. So they started to freak out. They started to complain. They told Moses, we told you to leave us in Egypt. Why did you bring us here so we can die in the desert? We were better off there, Moses. We could have just stayed there, Moses, and we could be happy. And I love Moses' answer. He said, oh, so politely, like a nice pastor, don't be afraid. Stand firm. He said, be still. In other words, God was telling Israel, shut up, stop freaking out, calm down, and watch me do what I promised to do. You know, when I was a kid, my dad used to bring home chickens. We lived in the city, 
and he would still bring home chickens. And he would get a big old uh, a tree stump in the backyard. He'd get his axe. He'd get Roy and Jimmy, my brother, and I said, okay, you guys ready? So then he would get the chickens, and then he would chop their heads off, and then they would run around the yard, and blood would squirt all over the place, and we had to chase them, blood splattering all over us, because he wanted chicken soup. But I remember those chickens. So I have a feeling that's what Israel looked like. They were running around like a bunch of chickens with their head cut off. So what do we do when we're up against a battle and trial? We freak out. We call everybody else besides the Lord. We call the doctor. We call the counselor. We call our sister-in-law. We call our mother. We call whoever, everybody. And I knew a man, a Christian man. He had something wrong in his brain. and something wrong in his head. It was an illness. And I remember, you know, what we Mexicans do, and this is cultural, you know, we go to the curandera. I don't know if you heard of the curandera, sister. You know what I'm talking about? Sister knows what I'm talking about, the curandera. They're witches when you think about it. They're just witches. He drove, he went all the way to Mexico so the curandera could massage his head and do all sorts of stuff. A Christian man baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost. And then he testifies, after I did that, I was healed. So where are you going? Jehoshaphat was thinking, wait. But God, they're sharpening their swords, God, and we're just standing here? God said, yeah, be still and wait. There were other great battles. If you think about the battle of Gideon's army, there were thousands down. God shaved the army down from thousands to 300. It was 300 versus 135,000. But at least they got to... Break jars and blow trumpets. So sometimes God wants you to do something. But sometimes he just wants you to stop and let God be under in complete control. So they were just standing there. The army was running at them. They were just standing there. Why do we have to just be quiet? And why do we just have to listen? But Because I believe God wants us wants to give us the next, next instruction. He wants to tell you what to do. Waiting on the Lord takes faith. Some of us today have a great need. Some of us need healing. Some of us need an answer to a serious problem. Some of us need direction on a decision. I know I do. God just wants you to be still. Be quiet and listen. Because he wants to redirect you. He wants you to pause and listen for his instruction and for the next step. Number three, he praised. We're about finished. Verse 21 and 22. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out at the head of the army, saying, Give thanks to the Lord, for his love endures forever. As they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. The word of God says that the people that Israel began to march toward their enemies. It doesn't say that they held up swords. It doesn't say that they held up shields. They just char they didn't charge them with horses and chariots. The word of God says they sang and they praised God. And at the very moment that they did that, the word of God says that he set up ambushes and the enemy just turned upon themselves, all three, one, all three of those football teams, and they just began to kill each other. But notice what triggered the defeat, the praise and the worship, the moment they started doing that. The Word of God says nobody survived. God said, get the singers together, get the praise team in position. The moment you start praising Jehoshaphat, you will see my glory. You will see great things. You will see your victory, Jehoshaphat. Brother and sister, most people wait until after the victory to praise God. Can you praise him during the battle? 
Can you praise him in the middle of the battle? Can you praise him when the battle is staring you down and intimidating, intimidating you? Can you praise him when there is no victory, nowhere in sight? I remember when I was a kid, there was a sister who used to pound her tambourine so hard. She sat in front of me. She was good at it. Her name was Rachel Mace. And that girl could get down on that tambourine. And one day she was pounding it so hard that the nail went through her hand because they have nails to hold down the bells. And I just remember her going, whoo, she screamed, but she looked at it, and she just kept pounding that tambourine. And bells just started flying all over the place. Are you willing to praise God so fully, praise God with so much passion that you're willing to just beat the bells off of that tambourine? So the power of God will be released in the middle of the battle if you praise him. Paul and Silas praised him while they were in jail. And what happened? They caused an earthquake. Let's all stand. What is your battle? What is your trial? What is your situation? Finally, verse 16, on the fourth day they assembled in the valley of Baraka where they praised the Lord. This is why it is called the Valley of Rebekah to this day. The Word of God says there were only corpses left. No one escaped. But the Word of God said there was so much plunder, so much value, and everything that was left behind in the battle that they could not take it all away in one trip. It took Israel three days to take away the treasure, to take away the plunder. They named the place Barak, which means the place of blessing. But before it was the place of blessing, it was the place of fear. It was the place of anxiety. It was a place of worry. It was a place of defeat. It was a place of impossibility. It was the place of pain. But God intervened. Church, the place of battle, your trial, your problems, will become the place of blessing. The place where your battles are today Will it be the place of blessing tomorrow? So if you're fighting a battle today, maybe in your marriage, maybe you're fighting a battle in your finances, maybe you're fighting a battle in your emotions, maybe you're fighting against an illness, or maybe you're fighting against a sin. God says, just wait upon the your blessing is coming. The battle is not ours. It belongs to the Lord. What are we willing to do, church? What are we going to do to receive our battle? Let's just praise Him for a little bit. Let's just glorify Him for a little bit. Let's just remind God. God, you don't need my reminder, but I do, God. I remember what you've done for me to bring me this far, God. I remember the healing and the liberation, Jesus. I remember the miracles. My life is a miracle, God. My life is a miracle, and that is why I am here, God. Nothing is impossible for you, God. Forgive me for doubting. Forgive me for worrying, God. Nothing is impossible for you, God. Hallelujah, Jesus. I will praise you in the process. I will glorify you in the process. I will acknowledge that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords in the process, God. Hallelujah. Nothing is impossible for you, Jesus. Just bring God your situation. Just bring it to him. I imagine the altar. I imagine the altar as a banquet table 
full of my favorite foods. And God says, here, take, eat, and receive. Sometimes we come to the altar already full because we've eaten somewhere else. We've eaten something else. And we don't take everything God has offering to us at the altar on a silver platter. God says, come and eat. Come and be blessed. Come and be delivered. Come and be healed.